You're listening to Monocle on Sunday, first broadcast on the 18th of July 2021 on Monocle 24. Good morning from Zurich. You're listening to Monocle on Sunday with me, Tyler Brule. Coming up, much to discuss on the program. Florian Egley, one of our guests today, is here. He's got his newspapers open. Florian, what's caught your eye? I'll start with a quote by Friederike Otto from University of Oxford in the New York Times. I say this as a German, the idea that you could possibly die from weather is completely alien. So what we've seen in this week in Germany and around Europe with the floods and hundreds of people dying um, is, I think, remarkable. And even in contrast with what we've seen in North America with heat waves, it really points to the fact that we as societies have to adapt to a changing climate. Very good. We'll be discussing that in great detail for and also we're going to be heading to Tokyo. I'm Fiona Wilson, Monocle's Tokyo Bureau Chief. I'll be bringing you the latest Olympic news from Tokyo 2020. More from Fiona a little bit later as well. Plus, we're going to be heading to Berlin to find out which books and magazines are certainly making popular reading over the course of the summer. It's the 18th of July, 2021, live from a sort of sunny Zurich. This is Monocle on Sunday. Live from Zurich, this is Monocle on Sunday with Tyler Brulé. Good morning from Zurich. Indeed, it uh, sort of shows a bit of a promise of uh, some sunshine today. Uh, the city, uh, like much of Europe, is drying out at the moment. A very happy uh, to report. So, of course, in this part of the world, uh, everyone is also headed off on holiday. That's looking like a little bit of a ghost town, uh, which is no bad thing because it means we have most of our city to ourselves, which is which is very good news. Uh, Florian Egli uh, is here. Of course, you're going to be talking about the weather. That's uh, what you promised all of our, our listeners uh, this morning. Uh, Chandra Kurt is also here, fresh from Paris, uh, and it sounds like it was uh, a rather good week, or at least a, g- a good 48 hours. Good morning, Chandra. Good morning, Tyler. Yeah, I'm just back from Paris yesterday evening. Unusually, <clears throat> I came back with the train, you know, I didn't fly. So also the TGV was wonderful. I felt like in a private jet. I had good space, good table to work. And of course, I love to be in Paris. It's just like a boost of energy. And what was the, the, the feeling? Because uh, the last time I was in Paris, most of these times the city has uh, really, yeah, the, the sidewalks were all rolled up and it was it was quiet the last time of I course, was there. Of course, you know, Paris is damaged. You can you can also see that Paris is a city that it used to be hurt from time to time. So I feel she's very, she's, she's not, not 100% well. A lot of shops are closed. But when you go into the restaurants, they're full and they're bubbling and people are happy to be together and eat together and drink together and see each other and exchange and, you know, and this intellectuality that I feel there, it, it was really just so good. Florian, uh, I don't want to give away your holiday plans. You're heading to the other uh, end of France uh, v- very soon. Mar- Marseille is uh, awaiting. Marseille is up next week, exactly. And, and of all the places that you could choose to go in Europe for, uh, for a little summer break, uh, why Marseille? I love this city. It's uh, it's a bit different to, to Paris. It's a bit less, I would say, ordered. It's a bit more chaotic. Um, it's bustling with energy. I love the fact that it's a port city and it's been a port city and you, it's kind of part of the identity of Marseille. And I have a very good friend who's living there, of course, as well. Also helpful. And you're going to Arles as well, I believe. Yes, I was planning. Um, so we're planning one day in Arles where the, where the Luma Museum, the new museum, um, that is uh, funded by the by Maya Hofmann from the La Roche family. So there's a link to Switzerland there. Um, it opened up. I believe it's um, it was built by Frank Gehry. So it's a it's a beautiful building um, and it's an interesting space because it's this kind of art, but also um, collaborative space where you can build things in the in the basement in the basement where there's a lot of exchange with scientists. So I'm excited to see what's going on there. Very good. Uh, also, uh, Andrew Tuck, our editor in chief, is. He's actually not quite in London, if I'm, if I'm to believe the script. He's in Stratford upon Avon uh, today. Andrew Tuck, good morning. Uh, good morning from, yes, from Stratford and uh, super sunny here. So uh, nice to be on the show. And, and, and buzzling, uh, bustling and alive uh, yeah. as well. It's interesting, Tyler, because you know, we've been coming up here for personal reasons over the last few months. Uh, and I hadn't been here for, for a few weeks uh, because of travel and being actually I was pinged. Um, but uh, going around the town yesterday, so of course, the weather helps. But the Royal Shakespeare Company is here. They've, they've built an outdoor theatre. So when we went past on, on, on Friday evening, already there's you know, there were theatre shows uh, taking place outdoors. 
in this weather, people have really made use of the pavement. So there's there's a lot of bustle going on. But these regional towns were hit very hard by the pandemic. And there's still a lot of very empty stores and big units that you know dominate the high street. It hasn't got its old swagger back. And this is a town also where many people would come from China to do English language courses. They're not here. That where lots of uh, coachloads of American tourists would come to see the sites of uh, Shakespeare's life. They're not here. So it, it, we've got used to what we we keep on tricking ourselves. It looks almost normal, but it isn't really. But it's much better than it was. Mm. Ch- Chandra, just to, being fresh from Paris, uh, did you did you notice uh, a bit of an uptick in tourism? I was in Munich earlier in the week, and I was really surprised when I was in the the hotel lobby at the Mandarin. Full of Americans. Uh, there was there was tons of Americans, you know, and they were some were on a tour, uh, some were just in this in this you know just in in the city, uh, you know, on their way uh, to to other destinations in Europe. But that was really a surprise to see that the Americans were back in force. What was your sense of Paris? The, the same, the same. It, uh, it was really full of Americans, not other tourists a lot, and it was nice to hear finally again Americans. So I enjoyed actually, too. But. Otherwise, no, it, not not so many people. You know, it's still still careful. I just want to go over to you, Florian, just to, to quickly because you picked up on, I guess, what is the other the other story, and we can reflect on this from the UK as well. Andrew's sort of talking about the weather, which is you know something which is dominating all of the of the press um, at the moment, and of course these are the floods here, but probably something of of surprise. And you you led the program talking about, you know, Germany what's happened uh, there, that this is not that it's unthinkable, but for a country which, of course, you know, talks up uh, and, and trades on its engineering prowess and a country which is, you know, yeah, in a way is seen as dependable. Um, there's a lot of questions uh, this morning uh, you know, being raised about you know, how could this simply have happened that the warning systems uh, aren't aren't in place but uh, maybe you want to pick up somewhere indeed and i think we're only at the very beginning of this conversation so this is the um, front page of the ft weekend and also the front page of the largest sunday newspaper in switzerland the nz am sonntag um and i think yes i mean as you said you know germans take a lot of pride in their engineering skills i mean they have um, some of the best technical universities in the world you know um, they're they're behind some of the largest companies i mean siemens as an example and it's really, you know, it raises questions as to how um, even, you know, very, I would say, uh, well prepared societies um, can manage these these extremely, um, you know, drastic and, and sudden weather changes that will just increase in frequency as we progress into into a hotter climate. And and I think, you know, I mean, also from a, from a, from a monetary perspective. So I read in the Financial Times that Aon, the large insurance company, um, two weeks in June already already were the costliest weeks in Europe with, um, they estimate, 4.5 billion um, in damages. And now, you know, we're in July and again, the same thing happened. So in June, it was it was basically hail and heavy rains. Now it's the floodings. So um, and at the same time, you know, not to forget, if you look across the Atlantic, very similar things happen, just not with rain, but with fire over there. So it really raises questions to the preparedness of our societies, you know, in this in this changing climate. And maybe to to um, to finish on a note with Germany, I think there what's really interesting is it might really um, have an impact on the elections in September because so of course um, Germany debates on who will be the successor to Angela Merkel in September. And this will really shape what the European Union is doing and therefore has large ramifications on global politics as well. And the green candidate, Annalena Baerbock, um, started off kind of as the as the champion in this race and then really lost ground in the past, I would say, one to two months, also due to a very well coordinated campaign against her. Um, And now this kind of tide might turn again, because, of course, this brings to the front pages and to really the the attention of the people, the concerns around around the environment and the climate. And then, as said in the beginning of the show, Armin Laschet, the um, candidate from the Conservative Party, was caught on camera laughing um, at an event, you know, where um, the German president, um, Walter Steinmeier, was kind of offering relief to the people in the affected regions, which I think will really not go down well with a lot of voters. Mm. 
Andrew, how was how was this story though also uh, playing uh, in the UK in the UK? Because of course we've got a lot of people uh, doing a bit of a tit for tat uh, at the moment. Uh, we can talk about also uh, cer- certainly uh, the UK's uh, take on how they're dealing with returnees from France um, at the moment. There has been a bit of uh, point scoring um, as, as well, but uh, this you know the, the sort of state of crisis, particularly um, when it comes to brand Germany. What do, what are you seeing this morning? Well, I think there's em- empathy, to be honest. I think the, the, the pictures that have been on all the, the front pages here, on all the websites, uh, are just so shocking. And the, the before and afters of these, these places that have just been swept away, I think has only generated empathy from, you know, you have to remember that the, the UK has often been hit by floods in devastating ways. And our lack of preparedness has... has has been brought home again and again from the, our failure to dredge rivers, from our inability to build the kind of protections that you need to to look after towns and villages across the country. So I think it's more one of empathy one, than one of shock. But the France story obviously is, is slightly different. We've obviously moved them into a different grade of amber. So this is amber plus telling everybody who comes back from France now that you have to do 10 days in quarantine. And someone pointed out that there's a hint they might even go to red. And if they did that, you'd have to find hotel rooms for currently 500,000 holidaying Brits in France. So that's going to be a bit of a boost for the the hotel industry if it happens. I want to bring in someone who is, uh, of course, uh, been attempting uh, to get to the continent as well. But maybe, Emma, you're not going to want to leave because uh, you you might have a few bedrooms that you might uh, want to rent out. We have multiple bookings in multiple places, Tyler. I think we're doing what many British people are doing, which is to... um, uh, we have a place booked somewhere in about two weeks' time, but we actually haven't told our son that we may be going abroad just in case it all goes wrong. And so we have we have booked six nights in a hotel in Guildford as a backup, and I have no idea why we've chosen Guildford, but it is one of those things that you just take what you can where you are. We're dealing with a nine-year-old boy here, so all he needs to do is basically have a hotel room with room service and a pool. Frankly, he could be on the moon. And I think just keeping it simple. Um, but what we're tr- also trying to do is it, you can't predict these things because there was a temptation to go to France, but no, that's not happening. And there is a general feeling that um, there's just confusion and there's uncertainty and people are not sure whether to go on holiday or not. And there, there seems to be quite a, a sort of lack of confidence. Andrew, are you experiencing the same thing in terms of of finding out or hearing from friends and colleagues who are saying, I'm trying to do this, but I can't. And and the trust is sort of slightly eroded, especially with what happened with France. I think lots of people are waiting to last minute. And look, you know, I'm, I'm in a, mu- a, a different position. I, you know, I, I don't have... Uh, children, so I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying to book for four or five people. So that makes it a little bit easier for me to be responsive to whatever whatever is happening. And I think this double jab thing, as long as they stick with it, it does give you some guarantee that you can begin to travel around again. So I, I think everyone's just become very kind of opportunity aware. You see something, you think, okay. We can do that. Let's go now. There's a possibility that we can we can finally travel. But the, again, and which Tyler has become a cropper with is you know that what's weird is the UK has managed to kind of get all this agreement for us to travel, but all our friends on the on the continent still can't come to London. We have a, a kind of a one way street going on. It's uh, interesting. I mean, there's reports today in the in the newspapers of. Florian, that we have um, an issue in Switzerland now that that some areas of Switzerland are reporting just 20% in hotel bookings at the moment. I mean, it's it's quieter, which is quite nice if you live there. But how how Switzerland feeling this this year? I think for Switzerland, I mean, especially for the tourism industry, it will be a tough summer because last summer, you know, hotels were empty in the cities, of course, because there was no business travel. But hotels were pretty well booked in the mountain regions. And so um, the regions that I usually go to, I mean, I think everybody I spoke to um, said it was the busiest summer they can remember. Um, You know, the the bakery in this little town, they even, you know, ran out of ingredients to bake bread at some stage. So, I mean, I think it was extremely busy and everybody was just hoping for it to, to you know calm down because people in these mountain villages actually like their calm so they get this now but um, there is a price tag to this because now Swiss people really book holidays um, you know in in actually I would say in proximity um, so lots of people going to Spain to Italy to Greece um, but not so many families especially deciding to spend their holidays in the mountains of Switzerland like last year so it's not surprising that these bookings are, are down a lot I think in the long run though the last year has probably shown to quite a bit of Swiss people that you know holidays especially also summer holidays in Switzerland might be worthwhile and I would expect you know um, that this year nobody really wants this because 
because everybody wants to get out. Um, but then starting from next year, I would expect to see somewhat more Swiss people again making holidays in Switzerland. But of course, you know, as long as international tourism is also really low, which still is, um, the, the main clientele of, of the Swiss mountains is not here and the hotels are pretty empty. Chandra, I know that I'm drinking a lot of Greek wine at the moment and quite a lot of Italian wine because that's the closest I'm going to get. Are you finding that people are, are, are drinking more internationally? Right now they drink a lot of, of Swiss wine. Also, I think it was important to support the Swiss wine industry. You know, that not, not the restaurants were closed and there were no events. So where did all the Swiss wine go? So I think Swiss people helped really a lot to, to drink uh, Swiss wine. But also here there, there will be a little bit of change that you that you want to explore new wines and other wines. In Switzerland is a very developed wine market, meaning we have wines from all over and you can choose from, from all over. So, um, yeah, it will be a little bit, you know, a change again. Emma, I just don't hear the cars honking outside. They know that Chandra Chandra's here as well. And I think that they they, they certainly want to hear your briefing, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> because they, they, they know they know it's wine corner time uh, <laughs> at, at, at the moment. Because it, there's, there's something, as, as you know, it often happens here that no matter what, even if it's a quiet Sunday, it's not a gar- <laughs> if it's not a garbage truck, if it's not sort of someone fixing their Ferrari, um, then it's um, then it, that it, that it's someone else who has some issues beyond our studio walls here. Anyway, anyway, Emma, why don't I start with with you? Okay. Uh, and uh, and maybe we uh, you know, co- conjure up a bit of a day. Maybe it has to do something with pinging or something like that. Oh yes. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can go from there and we'll move on to Stratford after that. OK, thank you very much indeed, Tyler. Uh, Chandra, uh, thank you for being, uh, I think we've described you in the past as a healthcare provider and you would definitely qualify as an essential worker were you to be in the United Kingdom. Fantastic. Such, <laughs> such are the services that you provide to us <laughs> on a Sunday. OK, so imagine I'm being pinged. I really don't want this to happen and it's not going to happen. You have uh, to explain to me, what is pinged? OK, when you have, uh, in the United Kingdom, there's a, there's a thing, an app on your phone that lets you know if you've been in touch with someone who's had COVID and you have to self-isolate. You have to go oh into God. quarantine. Yeah, it's, So if it's, you come in proximity to this, don't worry, it's not going to happen so to you anyway. It's not going to happen to yeah, You're not um, going to download that app. It's, no, don't, don't I'm, worry about it. I'm going to be in the garden today and I may well be in the garden for the next few days if I get pinged. So for you, Chandra, the brief this week is not quality, but quantity. So... <laughs> If I'm stuck... You make my day, Emma. Thank you. <laughs> if I'm stuck and I have to be stuck for quite a few okay. days, get something that's... that's What is it? Good, you know... Sim, is it einfach gut, but gut und einfach? Einfach, aber gut. Einfach, aber gut. Gut, aber einfach. Okay. Simpli- keep it simple, Chandra. Good. And, and yeah, keep... And, and quantity, please. A lot. Okay. okay. That, that's very clear. A- Andrew, you're in your Elizabethan outfit uh, down down there in, St- in Stratford. Uh, what, what's going to go in your goblet? Can I just say that that is one of the grandest statements I've ever heard from Chandra. What is pinged? She certainly reminded me of, I don't know if you ever saw Downton Abbey where, where Maggie Smith was playing the dowager and she, from her grand chair, she said, what is a weekend? And I think that Ch- Chandra is like the Swiss Maggie Smith. What is pinged? Oh, you also made my day. <laughs> okay, Andrew. Uh, okay, Chandra. If I was going to have a drink, for example, in Zurich tomorrow night with Tyler, what should I have? Uh, the terrace. Because that's a fact. It's going to be yeah, there's going to be outdoors. But they're going to lay on great weather for us tomorrow. There's, there's <laughs> going to be, I think, a roof terrace involved uh, around the corner. Hey, if your roof terrace is open as well, and Andrew's coming to town, <laughs> we can we can talk about it. Uh, but yes, okay, that's that sounds. Is that enough to work with, Chandra? A drink outside tomorrow evening. Yeah, that's what yeah, he's wondering. What what, okay. what could we be having? What would be Florian? fun? So I'll have a bit of a challenge for you too, Chandra. So I'm going to Marseille, I said, and this as you know, I'm taking the train because, you know, conscious citizen and everything. But this is a very long train ride. So this is about a seven hour train ride, you know, stopping over in Geneva um, shortly. So I think I need a bottle to accompany me. Um, So there will be two or three of us. So yeah there, there's even scope for two i think but we can't keep them cool for too long so um i don't know what would you recommend for a seven hour train ride on a on a wednesday you know afternoon evening arriving at eleven thirty in marseille so quite late I, I think we can find you a cooler. Uh, so, you know, yeah. Maybe when we're off Maybe, air, maybe there's when a monocle when, edition when, of a when, cooler. When Emma's reading the news or something, I think I'm sure we can sort of, you know, scoot downstairs and uh, <laughs> and, and find something to sort of show. Uh, just, I, I just, there was a little, a little bit of a news story that we were talking about earlier, which was um, 
your your point about Migro um, and and this whole story, what is happening with uh, with Migro here in in Switzerland, and maybe you can just set this up for us a, a little bit, uh, Florian, because Emma talked about it in, in the news bulletin, uh, but uh, but what what is happening here in the papers? So yes, I mean Migro is an institution in Switzerland, so it's the it's still the largest supermarket chain, um, and it's so in, in my childhood memory, um, it was I mean first it was these 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 trucks, so basically it was like food trucks essentially, like little shops on wheels um, that would you know be in in towns and and you could buy the same product in every truck and in every town, and then you know gradually it started evolving towards supermarkets and and um, it's quite a big thing because it replaced all these small um, farmers market and everything. Um, and the founder um, of, of Migro, um, his, his name is Tutwiler, he was very much involved with society. So he was um, in politics. Um, there is basically a foundation. Um, Migro is giving 1% of its profits to cultural projects. So he was very much saw this supermarket as a transformative tool um, for society. And he was um, very in the, I would say, in the in the um, um, Zwingli tradition, so in the in the um, how to say that, so that maybe Calvin is more is more prominent. So in the very strict and and austere um, kind of view of society, um, he was a, he was a hard worker, you know, against um, all things for pleasure, amongst um, alcohol and tobacco. So um, one of the really key principles of Migro was that they do not sell these products, um, and that led, of course, gradually to a situation where um, they lost a lot of business compared to their competitors. Then they acquired a competitor, Denner, which almost exclusively sells alcohol. Um, so they kind of got around this. But now, um, during the pandemic, Migro has lost market shares yet another time. And there is more bu- pressure building up. And now we hear that there is going to be a vote because the whole supermarket is organized as a cooperative. So there is actually going to be a, a grand or general vote on whether or not Migro is, you know, keeps um, not selling alcohol um, and tobacco. Um, then the next option is they sell alcohol but remain out of the tobacco, tobacco business. And the last option is that they do both. Um, and the rumors say that at least um, in you know the the executive circles, there is quite a lot of support for um, scrapping both provisions, so for selling alcohol and tobacco. So that would be a, a game changer in Switzerland. And uh, Chandra, as our uh, chief uh, lifestyle and uh, health correspondent uh, on this topic, uh, what, what, what do you make of this? Of, of course, you're, you're, you're very much in, involved, obviously, in the wine business with, of course, many of the, of the, of the players and providers in that space. Uh, is it OK for Migro? Does it seem modern for Migro to still sit outside of this or not? What do you think? Well, um, how shall I say? You know, Switzerland always has a lot of of special behavior. Like Sundays, the shops are closed, or or we are not so international. Even we are international, but we we keep special rules. And Migro was really a phenomenon <clears throat> that even you have food and everything, they didn't sell 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 wine, and, but they sold wine indirectly online or by by having dinner, which is a very important um, place to buy alcohol or wine. I don't want to call it alcohol; it's wine and and spirits, and. Um, and of course, I understand people come and buy food, food and everything. They had Globus before. They don't have Globus anymore. And uh, so why not to sell wine? I mean, you have the space. You, you people buy food. You, you usually drink wine when you cook and, and everybody's now cooking a lot at home. So so why not? I'm, I don't know if it's going to work because it's for many years they discussed it. It comes all the time again and then then they don't to do it but um but why not i mean it's it's, it's a huge space for for uh, for also producers to place their wines absolutely it, 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 no, it seems a little bit strange because uh, you know they've also got a, a convenience chain called migrolino which is basically the same brand and you have no problem uh, going in and buying you know wine um uh, cigarettes uh, it's 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 all present in the lineup there and it's mm-hmm. basically under the same umbrella too yeah so it's it's just you know it's it's some some it's like you do but you don't do it so it's like hidden and and mm-hmm. yes and no but but why not? No, in, interesting. Um, just uh, before we before we go, uh, Florian, when uh, when you're looking at at the papers, you have any any fun stories? I mean, one of the stories I saw today was that uh, Jurg Marquardt, uh, who is is famous as as a publisher here, he's moving out of the palace. He's been living in the palace tower or at least renting it for the last thirty years. He's lo- he's lost his his lease o- on this, <laughs> um, and is now going to be going elsewhere. They said we don't have to worry about it because he's got. Uh, 
50 meters plus on his boat, uh, the the Azura. Anything to top that in, in the papers, anyone? <laughs> I, di- I didn't see that story. So another story um, in terms of travel plans. So I see that Russia is renovating its second, um, um, it's, it's a freight line, um, basically a line just above the Trans-Siberian Railway. Wait, which is it a I've freight never... line or a freight line? A freight, Cause, cause, excuse you me, could a freight. Maybe, maybe a bit of both. <laughs> the because well. they say they put in, I think, 17 billion US dollars, which seems like a crazy sum. Um, and and this this seems to be a, a railway line, you know, over four thousand three hundred kilometers, ending just north of Vladivostok. That just goes to, ex- I mean, completely wild and pristine um, landscapes. And I think there is only mining towns um, on the line. Um, so um, if that gets renovated, it might be, you know, a new travel plan. Mm, I don't go to Chandra asking how many bottles of, of wine. Maybe it wouldn't be wine <laughs> need, that, that you need, or how for many the, coolers for, for, the, for that for that journey. Uh, Emma Nelson is back in London with the news headlines. Thank you very much indeed, Tyler. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel is to visit areas worst affected by flooding later today. At least 170 people have died and hundreds are still missing. Two athletes at the Tokyo Olympic Athletes Village have tested positive for coronavirus. That's five days before the start of the Games. Members of the British Cabinet and the Prime Minister find out later if they have to self-isolate on so-called Freedom Day when COVID restrictions are due to be lifted. It follows confirmation that the Health Secretary has got COVID-19. And a report from the New York Times says they're back. Two dozen goats have eaten their way through a New York park. It says after taking a break last year, goats have returned to help fend off invasive plant species. New Yorkers are using ranked choice voting to pick their favourite goats. And those are the headlines. Back to you, Tyler, in Zurich. I love the sound of that. And when you come over and visit uh, at the school next door, we have <laughs> some sheep. I prefer a goat, but I we like have goats. some sheep that are, that are, that are shipped in for the summer uh, to, to look after the, the playground while, while the kids are away. They're, well, actually, they're, they're there when the kids are there as well. Wonderful. I was, it's made me think that, you know, we have Monochan as a, mm. as a representative in, for, for, for Monocle. Why, where is the goat? There yeah, must be. There's scope. There's scope for a Xeric goat representative. S- scope surely. for a goat. Yeah, this is this is a very good question because I'm because you know Monochan, he was developed in Japan uh, and he's very much part of the sort of the Chan mos- ma- mascot world. You don't see a lot of goats in Japan. There are goat cafes, as you know, where you can rent. This is maybe a, a bit of a business opportunity we're missing uh, because they because Monochan is an owl and they have owl cafes where you can go and rent an owl for half an hour and you know, sip your coffee. And you can also have, um, there's, there. I know, I think quite close to the office, we can talk to Fiona about this in a few minutes. Um, there is a goat cafe as well. Right. Okay. There we go. We've sorted out your next business model for the next 10, 15 years. Goat well, that's, that's, that's also the park sorted out in front of you as well, <laughs> right? Absolutely. If, 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 the city, if the city would allow it. Uh, Emma will be talking to you towards the end of the program when we're going to find out what you might be doing with that, that ping wine. Uh, it's just uh, gone 17.32 uh, in, uh, in Seoul. It's, uh, it's 10.32 here in Zurich. And we're now heading a little bit due north to the capital of the Federal Republic. I'm very happy to say uh, that Mark Kiesling is on the line uh, from Do You Read Me? Uh, of course, listeners, if you don't know Do You Read Me, uh, it's certainly been in the magazine many, many times, an absolutely outstanding uh, purveyor of fine periodicals and books um, in, in the heart of Berlin and certainly a firm favorite of the family. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. I, I wanted to, uh, to maybe just start last time we checked in. Of course, uh, you, you were uh, not reopening, but Berlin was reopening. Uh, you'd managed to keep your, your do- doors open and, of course, providing a very essential service in terms of giving people uh, great things um, to read. But we are talking to Chandra a little bit earlier um, in the program. She was giving us uh, her feedback on, on how Paris um, was feeling. Um, as, uh, as Berlin moves into its version of high summer, how is the retail scene, how is the street uh, feeling uh, beyond the doors of Do You Read Me? Uh, I'm happy to say that it gets a little bit more crowded now um, with tourists uh, coming to town. Um, normally, the summer is uh, is uh, all Berliners just uh, check out of Berlin, and so streets tend to get quite empty. Uh, and in a normal year or in a normal summer, then the streets get filled up with tourists. But um, this year is, of course, a little bit calmer. So, but we're happy that uh, the numbers are going down and we are allowed to let like now 10 people again in the store, which is uh, almost triple than uh, we had in the springtime. So it was only three t- uh, people allowed. So it's, it's, it's getting better. And uh, at least it feels better with the good weather. Um, 
and as as the as the Berliners head away, and hopefully you have uh, more people coming uh, into uh, to the Hauptstadt uh, of of Berlin. Maybe why don't we start with books? Um, maybe a couple of recommendations. Uh, what what are you seeing people picking up at the moment? Either to uh, to of course take to one of the lakes uh, in the afternoon, or maybe to put on their coffee tables. Well, as we are not like a, a normal literature bookshop, um, if you want to pick up something for, for reading, normally people tend to pick up a magazine. Uh, but with books, um, especially, there have been two volumes on Berlin, uh, quite popular. One is a photography book by uh, Felix Brüggemann and Robert Rieger on the um, Otto Lilienthal, the now closed uh, Berlin Tegel Airport. Um, and they uh, took the opportunity to take pictures when it was uh, in full lockdown, so in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and the second one is uh, on Berlin Maps, um, which is uh, more like, a, let's say, a, a research or an atlas uh, on all the different stages um, uh, that uh, and the countless transformations Berlin went through. Um, it's taking really um, everything from special to strange to undiscovered phenomena uh, like tunnels or um, artificial mountains and so on. And it's, uh, it's quite a nice publication as well. It's interesting to watch uh, if, we, if we go over to the the periodical side. Of course, the the enduring power of the the Spanish, uh, well, certainly Barcelona-based magazine, uh, Apartamento, and it's been mm. fascinating to watch them also move into the world of of book publishing um, yeah. as well and and addressing a variety of topics. But um, I note here that uh, they have a, a new title which uh, seems to be uh, certainly topping topping your charts. Um, yeah, they have uh, now a cookbook, um, which is um, for them, um, it's more like a small publication. It's by Frederic uh, Bille Brahe, um, who runs uh, two or three restaurants um, in, in Copenhagen. And it's uh, more like the same coming out of the, the lockdown as well. So they just gathered like uh, or collected their most favorite simple dishes that they like to cook uh, as a team or for the family. And it's uh, quite easy or cheaply produced, uh, but very nice to, to look at and, and browse and, and as well cook uh, after. Uh, and it's already the third edition now. So this really sells um, quite, quite well and is well appreciated. Uh, tell me if we look at, uh, of course, trends and and, cert- and I'm talking about trends. Maybe let's move to the to the magazines uh, that are on, on offer right now. Before you, uh, when we spoke, uh, of course, you know, magazines that had to do with anything in terms of architecture and design and thinking about the everything within and outside of our four walls uh, was was doing well. Uh, of course, titles that had to do with with cooking are, as the world mo- uh, opens mm. up. Uh, are you seeing now a spike in, uh, in in travel titles or at least titles? That uh, that certainly encourage some sense of, of wanderlust or, or or anything beyond that. Uh, actually, not yet. No, uh, I think it was more in the beginning of the pandemic that people really thought, well, uh, let's try to to use this time that we we now have maybe um, at home to think about the next uh, holidays and for traveling. Uh, in the meantime, it's more like really an. Uh, back to normal thing uh, on topics. Uh, interiors is still quite popular. Um, of course, as well, plants and everything uh, uh, around. Um, um, sustainability and uh, um, it's getting more and more popular, popular as well, and or still. So, um, but traveling is, uh, is still, people are a little bit skeptic, I'd say. <laughs> And uh, here's here's just a question. What something that comes up at Monocle from time to time? People say, you know, who are of course thinking about the environment and sustainability, mm-hmm. uh, say, well, you know, why are you publishing books and why are you publishing um, magazines? Uh, because this is unsustainable. Is this a question that uh, that you get also as as a bookseller in Berlin and also certainly a, a city which has a, a rather vocal uh, lobby uh, in in the green space? Actually not, no. Um, I think publishing or reading books is still quite um, the, of course, there's a sustainability factor to it, but uh, as paper or pulp um, can be recycled as well. Um, um, I think it's it's still uh, on the on the good side of, uh, of bad things, let's say like this. And um, so people really enjoy um, Browsing, people really enjoy reading on paper still uh, that we are quite happy about. 
And uh, it's actually not really a question. Um, it's more coming in, in terms of uh, packaging. So if it's sealed in plastic or has too many plastic uh, covers or stuff like that, then people say, is this really necessary? But normally it's, uh, it's quite okay. And I think it is, yeah. Good. Just fortify yourself for it, because I, th I, I think this one might, <laughs> still might be head, heading your direction. But I, I think we can all put up a good argument and fight around it. Finally, just uh, before we go, if we're heading back to uh, any of the nice lakes today, hopefully the sun is out uh, in uh, in Berlin as well today. Mark, three recommendations, three outstanding magazines you'd want to be um, putting in the basket of your bicycle today. Um. Well, uh, we, we were heading for holidays uh, this afternoon, so uh, I have for myself uh, just compiled a small pile that I, I would uh, like to, to read in the next days. Uh, it's uh, Akatone from uh, Belgium. It's uh, um, quite a, maybe a strange architecture magazine. It's visually very strong and associative, and uh, it's, it's uh, always uh, quite critical, but uh, it's really nice to, um, to go through because it's more like an exhibition on paper. Um, there's a new one called Balcony that is the first issue. Uh, it's more about artists in, uh, situated in the everyday. Uh, I did not really have the time to go through, but it looks like more like an apartamento take on arts and culture, um, giving lots of room to interviews and editorials. And uh, then there's a new magazine from New Zealand that we have now. It's called Index, and it's... Uh, um, as well on culture and social uh, uh, topics uh, influencing the art and fashion and design. And um, I like to read the editorials on Advon Sargent and Emily Bode that are quite large in there. So um, I'm really curious too. Well, we wish you a very, very good holiday, uh, at least with three titles to read. I'm sure there are many, many more. Uh, Mark Kiesling from Do You Read Me uh, in Berlin. We're going to be heading to Tokyo right after this. Our Fiona Wilson is standing by. You're listening to Monocle on Sunday. Monocle's July-August issue marks the return of our Quality of Life special edition that is guaranteed to get you in the mood for sun and for summer. Dive in for a look at everything from the year's urban winners to the tourist hotspots eagerly awaiting the return of travel. Whether you're planning a staycation party or a road trip abroad, our culture section interviews the global musicians that will provide you with the soundtrack for your summer. Hop in while the water's warm and order your copy of Monocle's July-August issue today or subscribe to get instant access to our digital editions. Head to monocle.com for more. back with Monocle on Sunday. It's uh, just 10.42 here in Zurich. It's uh, 17.42. We're heading to Tokyo right now. Our Fiona Wilson uh, is there. Fiona, I believe the Olympics are coming, uh, but uh, you, you'd never know it if you're watching TV channels in Europe. I saw the first promo on the BBC yesterday, which was this weird sort of live action take uh, on, on anime. I don't know if you've caught it yet, but uh, I'm sure it's going to cause a total storm of, of people who are not Japanese, but are somehow going to get offended watching it. But anyway, that, that's a whole other topic. Tune in and watch it when you can. Good afternoon, by the way. Hello. Hi. I haven't seen that one. I'm, I'm longing to see it. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a treat, let me tell you. I'll, I'll, I'll try to find it. Uh, how are things feeling? We're less than one week out from the, um, from the opening ceremonies. I mean, it's hard to believe, actually, that we finally reached the point where the Olympics are kind of round the corner. I mean, I feel like I've talked about it so much, written about it a lot. And <laughs> You know, there's just been so many ups and downs to get to this point. And even in the last week, my goodness, I mean, poor old Thomas Bach. I think it's a week to forget, really, isn't it? Um, for him, it's been very, very difficult this week. You know, he arrived, promptly referred to the Japanese as Chinese, which was a bad start. And um, it's pretty much, you know, being, got on from there, you know. We've had Ugandan weightlifter disappearing. Um, you know, we've had infections uh, in the Olympic Village now. Uh, 70,000 people signing a petition asking Thomas Bach not to go to Hiroshima, but he went anyway. So, yeah, it's been it, the final uh, stretch is, is still proving pretty thorny, I think. Just tell me quickly, uh, the missing Ugandan weightlifter, sort of ha sort of difficult to hide in Tokyo, I, I would imagine. But but that's that's a side issue. Ha uh, have, have they found the weightlifter? Well, I mean, you know, I think people have been mentioning similar things here. Well, so, you know. He, he, the, the, there was a suggestion that he was heading to Nagoya. In fact, he was spotted getting on a train to Tokyo. So I think he's somewhere in Tokyo. He hasn't been spotted yet, but 
I mean, you know, you do have to wonder what's going to happen there. Um, you know, it's, it's a slightly embarrassing side story, but, uh, you know, I, who knows how that's going to end. But at the moment, yeah, he's, he's somewhere in this huge city. So um, no weightlifting competition for him anyway. No, I was I was going to wonder. I, I'm wondering sort of what's going to happen to these these people because I, we, you know, we were talking about this many times over the past few months. That if anyone does go rogue, then you know they're going to be promptly put on a gel or or A and A flight out, out of the country. You know, banned all all of these types of things. So are you, are, are these sort of threats, of course, you know, continuing? And and I guess you know how how do the how do the Japanese feel about this? Do they think you know this is a country known for, of course, hospitality and uh, and then on on the flip side. Uh, I mean, of course, the Japanese like like the rules as well, but you have all of these draconian measures, and certainly, you know, mm-hmm. you and I should have been. I know I was probably going to be on your terrace or something uh, by by Wednesday this week, but I've I've had to cancel as well because speaking of going rogue, I mean, I was not going to be sitting in a hotel, then on a bus, and then going to the venue and then straight back. You know, that wasn't going to work. I mean, and that is really what's happening. So, you know. Given the real situation, probably better to uh, stay put in Zurich. Now, I mean, I think it's really hard for the Japanese because you're right. Hospitality is so important. We've got all these absolutely amazing restaurants here. We've got all these things that they wanted to show off and they just can't. You know, and now we're in a state of emergency. You know, you wouldn't be out, um, you know, drinking and eating much anyway. Restaurants are closing early, no alcohol. It's a very difficult time for the Japanese, never mind, you know, with the Olympics or otherwise. So I think, you know, always I felt like, People in Japan support the athletes. They re- they love the sport. They're they're very much behind that. But I think the whole tangle with the COVID handling, how it's been, how it's affected the way COVID's been handled by um, the government, and you're really seeing some pretty brutal polling figures for Prime Minister Suga now. I mean, in Tokyo, it's dropped below. Uh, I think the magic number is 30% approval, and I think if it goes below that, you're really in trouble. And Tokyo, he's now hit 28% approval. I'm, I'm amazed he's still getting 28% pr- approval ratings, frankly. But um, maybe he's hoping for, you know, a fantastic medal haul for Japan and, and everyone will forget about this whole drama. But hard to see at the moment. Yeah, it's really difficult time. Although, you know, all happening on, from Friday. So uh, <laughs> we'll wait and see. And how's, how's this playing out with the governor uh, of, of Tokyo? Because, of course, you know, in so many ways, often this is, well, not always, but can also be you know, a, fa- a fast track to, of course, um, bigger political position. So uh, as the host city, um, what, what's the governor saying? Yeah, I mean, I feel like Governor Koike, you know, she's extremely powerful. She's been angling for the top job in Japan for quite a while. And I feel she's been positioning herself rather well. She's constantly pitting Tokyo's approach against the national approach. So she's trying to be ahead of the government. She wanted tougher lockdowns earlier. She she has been much more sort of vocal, I would say. I think Suga's been quite hesitant because, you know, just the cost of these lockdowns. I was just reading that the this this fourth lockdown is is costing Tokyo nearly nine billion dollars alone, just this one. So, you know, it's very, very difficult uh, for, the, for the prime minister to make these big decisions about states of emergency. But I think Koike is, is she's playing a long game. And yeah, she'd love to get back into national politics. Now, she's fallen out with the LDP, the ruling party. So how she gets back in with them is going to be interesting. I don't know. It may just be that the prime minister Suga, who's up for re-election as leader in September, you know, if she could summon up enough of a faction and come back in, I don't know, it could be quite an interesting uh, runoff. But at the moment, there's nobody really in the frame to uh, to oppose Suga, seriously. Hard to believe with all the criticism, but but that's the state of the opposition at the moment. So um, I think, you know, Koike is definitely, as always, one to watch. So Fiona, we're going to definitely be talking to you over the weekend after off the back of the opening ceremonies because I'm sure there's going to be lots of uh, there's going to be lots of of, of uniform of uniforms uh, to to of course uh, dissect uh, uh, and and probably some some interesting entrances because it will certainly be an opening ceremony like no other, which brings us to a curious story uh, that uh, which is about the sale of of large screen TVs in Japan. Yeah, I mean, I I just thought oh this is just uh, you know. Maybe someone can get some good news out of this, that TV sales, uh, the sales of big TVs have really surged here. 
Um, I think now that no Japanese um, spectators even can come to the games, everyone's just going to big camera and buying the biggest TV they can get their hands on. So that's been one little bright spark of good news in the paper. Otherwise, it's a list of these very negative stories. But no, I think people accept we can't go in person, but they still want to watch it. Um, so, yeah, that, that's been, you know, in, in a sort of very difficult economic times, there was this ray of light that uh, TV sales for Japanese TV makers um, really surged. Have you set up a little sort of mini set of bleachers in the, in the Wilson household or, or maybe in the Monocle News Bureau? Well, I mean, you bet, because we've only just vacated the seats from the Euros. Um, you know, the Bureau kind of moved in the in the evenings to my house. I do have a large TV. I am one of the large TV buyers. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was quite, quite a nice way to pass the evening. So um, this will be in our time zone. So we, we can sort of do it as and when. But we've got three TVs in the office here, as you know, Tyler. So um, we can really be keeping an eye on what's going on and all the uh, the more obscure sports. Absolutely. Just before we go, Fiona, is there is there any sense as soon as the Olympics are are gone and uh, and uh, the circus is packed up and left town, that Japan is going to to reopen? Uh, of course, they're in a state of emergency right now, but we know why they're all of these measures because they want to be able mm. to pull this off as safe as possible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, do do you see any indications of where Japan goes next? Because now we're seeing many other countries in Asia sort of slightly wavering, saying that you know that the zero case policy, etc., the 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 literally the island nation uh, model is not working. Yeah, it's so difficult. Isn't it? I mean, nobody can see past the Olympics here at the moment. It's just like this massive kind of tower that stands in front of everyone. But I think infection numbers around Asia, Southeast Asia, very, very tricky at the moment. You see these huge numbers in Indonesia, just as an example. And I think people are hoping could it could even business corridors open. But Japan itself, Tokyo is seeing infection numbers that it hasn't seen since January. So at the moment, I hate to say it, but there's not much sign of opening up. Very depressing. I am now double vaccinated. So as soon as there's any news of uh, travel reopening, I will be uh, fighting on my way to the first flight, I think. Okay, well, I think we can, we, can, we can work on that. There is a conference in Athens coming up, but I think your, your presence is required. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Fiona Wilson, our Bureau Chief in Tokyo, uh, thank you very much for that. It's uh, just coming up to nine minutes uh, to the top of the hour uh, here in Zurich. Uh, Florian, are you going to uh, be hosting any big uh, Olympic uh, evenings, opening ceremony night around the Egli residence? No, not planned. I mean, I, we were hosting some big Euro nights, but I must say I'm a bit I'm a bit disconnected with these Olympic Games because I feel I mean it's a strange sign if there is an Olympic game and people are buying large screen TVs and that's the only positive news. I mean, why is that positive in the first place? Right? It should be a celebration and and kind of a get together. So. Yeah, I think it will probably pass by me without much fanfare, but let's see. Chandra, do you get uh, in, at all interested in the Olympic Games? Um, no, I'm still in the football. I'm still full for Italy and happy that they won. Yeah, well, this, this, this we know. And I, of, <laughs> of course, there, there, there'll be more, more matches uh, to watch on, on, that, on that front um, uh, as well. Uh, Andrew, uh, Tuck is back in, uh, in Stratford as well. Andrew, uh, what, 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 are, what are the Olympic plans uh, for, uh, for, for your household or, or for the office as well? Because, you know, we, we certainly have a number of keen sportsmen and, and women in the office in London. Well, I just can't wait for it to start. You know, it's there's so much negativity around it, and so many people putting up so many kind of complicated ideas about it. But when you see sports people playing, doing their best, when you see their young stories unfolding, I think that people will be swept away by it, and I think it's it. it I think it's going to be much better than people anticipate so i'm really looking forward to getting engaged with it again every year i'm not a huge sports fan but there's something about the olympics it is about more than just the sport it's about these human stories and an endeavor and i, and I can't wait to see it we should uh, speaking of uh, of course competitions and and we, we probably should have put out a little bit of a briefing to chandra as well what should what should one drink uh, for for an opening ceremony maybe we can just add that as a bit of a curveball before we, we we do the the round table with everyone else what what would you what would you say friday evening you know getting out in front of you know the bbc nbc uh schweizer fernsehen whoever is going to be hosting or uh, or whoever the host broadcasters are uh, what would you suggest well, we, we have to honor japan so i will you know or you drink some good sake. I could imagine even sake, sparkling sake, which gives a little bit of festivity. Um, they have also very good wine, which is maybe more difficult to get, some some koshu, but I will say sparkling sake. Okay, we like we like the sound of that. Okay, um, Emma Nelson is, is standing by and, uh, and basically I just... Your brief is basically you wanted a job lot of wine, but high quality. <laughs> well, 
Yes, if that's all right. Uh, although I was uh, utterly charmed by Chandra's uh, last last phrase of something that gives a little bit festivity. Um, I need that, please, Chandra. Um, you see, this, so, is, this, is, this is why I'm busy with wine. It gives me all the time festivity. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a feast. <laughs> no, no. no, no so, so you said you need loads and, and, and a lot of, of wine. <laughs> I'm, I'm picturing a but, fire or garden hose is going to be involved. <laughs> Luckily, there is enough wine on this planet, so this is a good news. And, yes, um, I, and just about. Yes. You, you were telling me before that you were reading the Decontra, so Decontra is a very good I wine do magazine. I read Decontra, yeah. And they have a good, good of wine also um, recommendation, and it means also you can you don't have to go only to to specific wine shops. You can also go to the retail stores. And you know, I do this book, this retail book, every since 24 years. I go all the little cop uh, my June, June, July. I'm spending tasting hundreds of wines and I all the time have to say good wine doesn't have to be expensive so if you go even to, to Lidl or Aldi that you have also in the UK you, you take some classic wines like a, even I know it sounds maybe to be afraid a uh, um, 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 uh, Cotiron wine or a Montepulciano wine they don't cost a lot but they are really good because they have to be good for all this quantity and, and, and the distribution they have Thank you Chandra I know that I know that Cote de Rhone is quite a heavy punchy wine so I'm not entirely what expecting I mean there's going to if there's going to be a lot of this drunk I think there's going, there might be a few it might get a bit interesting if I drink a lot of Cote de Rhone. just eat all the time just don't drink just eat all, all the know? time okay yeah. <laughs> And it sounds like we have to put double doors into the studio, maybe. But uh, <laughs> no, and in the garden you do exercise. So then, so. Oh, okay. This, on a related topic, uh, I think also you're semi looking for volume as well, because Lauren, you, you said earlier that you're looking for a wine that's going to take you from Zurich all the way to Marseille. Yeah. Maybe with a pit stop for a few more bottles. Exactly, and actually through the Côte du Rhône, so through like the Vallée du Rhône, so along the along the Rhône. Um, yes. What What do you have for me, Chandra? So first of all, you know. The, Buy a Magnum because you're a few people. So Magnum, big bottle. First suggestion. Um, and chill it down. I mean, so you can maybe take a, a bucket, you know, buy even a cheap bucket, have ice in it and, and make it different, you know, and put ice in water and have the bottle chilled. I would suggest not to start to drink in Switzerland. You know, Swiss people are a little bit controlled. So when you pass the border, open the bottle. And very important also here, I have to say, you have to eat. So buy and bring me some food, some sandwiches that you have um um, not just alcohol or wine, and uh, I will go for a rosé. You, you go to the, it's, you know, it's in the Provence, Marseille. So uh, Whispering Angel, very popular rosé right now, or from Chateau Minity, red wine. Buy buy wine fro- to the region where you go, so you feel where you're going. And don't forget to bring back bottles for your radio host. Brands yes, as I well. will. I will make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, uh, we have we have some good news as well for our listeners because. Chandra and we, we you know you were, Andrew you were asking a little bit earlier because you're on your way over to to Zurich and you'll be here tomorrow so we'll we'll probably be seeing Chandra uh, but also Chandra's going to be making an appearance in Athens which is fantastic news as well we're going to be bringing this whole format to life I know how great to have uh, Chandra in Athens um and we're going to be doing a little bit of a, a wine tasting which we've we've never done before and um we're going to suggest to people that they bring very large bags so that they can pack them <laughs> with cases of wine to take back all around the world from Greece. Because uh, uh, over, over the last few trips, and Tyler, I know before that, you've, you've managed to seek out a few good Santorini whites, for example. So we know there's plenty to bring back from there, and it's going to be have, great to have Chandra on hand. Absolutely. So Chandra, you're going to be taking the stage, hope, well, of course, with some very good producers, a good retailer as, as as well. And also, this is your first sort of big premiere at a Monocle Quality of Life conference. Yeah, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very, very happy and honoured that I can do that. I'm, I'm very much looking forward. And this was, this was, you know, it was, it was in part Andrew's idea. And we sort of, of course, uh, we, we managed to sort of, you know, pimp, pimp it up um, a little bit. But I think it's going, Andrew, it's going to be, it's going to be quite interactive as well. Just very quickly, 15 seconds, three, three other highlights that are going to be happening in Athens. We should say to our listeners, 23rd to the 25th of September uh, that we, this will be happening at the Benaki, uh, the Piraeus uh, uh, Museum uh, in, in the heart of Athens. We're going to show you why ancient Greece has got some good lessons for you today. We're going to introduce you to the, the top arts players in the whole city. And we're going to have a, a debate about tolerance, which will hopefully surprise a few people as well. 
Excellent. Well, Andrew will be exploring that. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, here uh, tomorrow uh, as well. That's all the time we have for today's programme. Chandra Kurt, Florian Egley, of course, Andrew Tuck, Emma Nelson back in London. Thanks very much. Also to Mark Kiesling in Berlin and our Fiona Wilson in Tokyo. Our producers were Emma Nelson and Mark Asipi, our studio manager in Zurich, Desiree Bandley, and uh, in London, Nora Hall has been looking after all of the audio for us today. I'm Tyler Burley. Monocle on Sunday is going to be back next week, so please uh, enjoy the weekend head and enjoy your Sunday. Goodbye.